Well, for our, our time this morning, I'd like for us to uh, ask a question and then hopefully give a few, uh, a few answers for it. Uh, and the question that I, that I had put up here, I had given the, the question of what can I do? And of course, the context we want to see is what can I do for God? So often in our lives, we see, we see something happen, and in a society where so many things are someone else's job, if there's a fire, well, that's, unless I'm on the fire department, that's not my job to put it out. I, I need to call them, and then they come, and I see a fire, and I think, they need to come and, they need to come and put that fire out. There's a, a, a hole in the road, and it, and it shakes my car or shakes the bus, and, and I think, someone needs to fix that. They need to come and fix that. And it's a, So often, m most of the things in our life, we can, we can live with an idea that it's someone else's job to take care of something. Well, in our life spiritually, and when we think about ourselves as, as, a, as a church family, as, as the body of Christ, is there anything that I can do to help those around me? This morning we, we looked at how in the Old Testament, God's laws, there were so many things that were, were to prepare their minds to pay attention, to, to look at, at others, and to make sure that if, if I have been mistreated, I don't mistreat someone else, uh, and, and so on. But what if, what if responsibilities, what things are my responsibility, and what things might be your responsibility? You know, uh, as when I was young, there were, there were other people older than me that took care of things, whether it be my, my parents or my grandparents or, or, or somebody older. When, when you're young and, and in the church, well, there are. There are things that somebody else is taking care of. And, and if we're not careful, we can all develop a, a, an idea that it's someone else's duty to live right for God. When it's my duty to live right for God, that each of us have some things that we can ask and, and, and in a question like when Peter says, to whom shall we go? There are questions that we can ask in our mind of what can I do for God? Many times we think about questions like that it, and it can be, what can, a, what can a young person do for God? But there is no age limit on, on our responsibilities quite often for, for ourselves and for trying to resist what the devil puts in front of us. That when we, we if we were to think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm too young, or if somebody on the other end can say, well, I'm, I'm too old for that. If you have a pulse, you're still, you're still young enough to listen and to obey God's word. So when we ask the question, what can I do for God? We think about Mark chapter 8 and verse 34 that says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That one of the first things that we just kind of make sure that we get out of the way on any list to say, What can I do for God? I can prepare myself and then obey the gospel of Christ. Uh, time after time, we see that, and, and uh, this was brought up in the in the class last night, that there is a sense that judgment day will be for those who obey Christ and those who not who do not. And a fearful expectation is all we can expect if we do not obey the gospel of Christ. So when we start with this to say, I need to obey the gospel of Christ, I need to obey. I need to do a part of what has already been done for me. Christ has already died for me, has already shed his blood for me. 
And what I need to do is obey the gospel to see how it is the instructions are of where do I start that relationship with Christ. And it is always talked about as in obeying the gospel. Of course, we see the, the list that would come from that of, of the acts of, of obedience to believe in him without a truly a faith in him. Uh, the passage there in John chapter 8 and verse 24 finishes by saying, if you do not believe that I am he, Jesus talking, says, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Of course, to repent of our sins. If there are sins in our life, they are not to stay there. We are to turn from them. When the question was asked, what must we do in, in Acts chapter 2? They were told to repent and let every one of you be baptized in his name. We've talked about these already, some this week too. The idea of also having the courage to say so. This is what I believe. This is what I hold to. Matthew chapter 10. We're told, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And the opposite is true too. He says, whoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father who is in heaven. We don't want that side. <laughs> what can I do? I can obey the gospel. Where is it that I start? Where is it that the Bible says that I start this relationship? While the world will talk about all kinds of different ways that we let Jesus into our heart, the scriptures say that it is at the point of the burial of baptism, that this is the start of this life with Christ, that we are to die to sin raised to walk in newness of life just as Christ had died on the cross raised uh, from the dead and in verse cha in verse 5 uh, of, of uh, Romans chapter 3 it says for if we have been united in the likeness of his death that is the symbolic picture of what the act of baptism is the folks will say well that's too simple or I've been told something else well the world may tell us something else but have they told us what the gospel says? It says we have to be, we have to die in the likeness of his death. Certainly we shall also uh, in the like, uh, be raised in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with him and that our body of sin might be done away with it. We should no longer be slaves of sin. The very picture of the first thing that I can do is in my relationship with everyone else is to start the relationship with God as, as God has said for it to be done. This is where the redemption, the blood is, is met. When Jesus said his blood was shed for the remission of sins, where was his blood shed? at his death. This is the point where we come in contact with Christ's blood in this death, burial, and resurrection that is symbolically this picture of, of obeying what we have been told to do. This is the, is the start of it. And you know, I used to, I used to have a Bible that I, I wrote down in, in Acts chapter 2 where it says uh, the instructions for being for receiving the remission of their sins, being baptized, receive the remission of sins, you should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I had a little note there that said, don't stop here. <laughs> that you have those that gladly receive the word, were baptized. And there was a sense of accepting what is said. What can I do? I can listen to God instead of anybody else. First and foremost, to obey the gospel. Well, we're going we're gonna to make a list for just a few minutes. What can I do as a Christian? What can I do as a servant of God in it to help my physical family, to help my spiritual family? What can I do for God? One of the first things that I will always need to strive to do is to keep myself pure. The world around us tries so hard 
to, to ruin this, to change our actions, to change our mind. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Back in Proverbs, it's taught, said, don't, do not follow a crowd to do evil. <coughs> you ever heard that, that phrase when somebody asks about somebody that maybe is no longer faithful to the Lord? And, and, and I, 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 the answer might be, well, they got in with the wrong crowd. Have, have, we, heard a, have we heard that kind of thing before? Well, quite often, if we start following the wrong crowd... It won't be long till we are doing the wrong things. And this is something that we always see. Paul admonished Timothy, keep yourself pure. And so often it can, it can have to do with the associations that we have. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We are constantly bombarded with things that will affect our purity. The, the, the thoughts uh, that are planted in our mind. So often there have been those that have been addicted to substances, but also there are those who have been addicted to things that they put into their mind. Do you know what the number one uh, source of people viewing pornography is in the world today? You think, you know, it's a com computer somewhere? It's handheld devices. The ease with which the world can affect someone's purity is something that has to be has to be fought against. That we have to resist the things that the devil puts in front of us. The picture that we see being said in in uh, in Matthew chapter sixteen. when the thoughts are to fight against what this world has. It says, For what profit is, is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? We have to constantly be, be striving for that, uh, for that purity. Matthew chapter 5, again, uh, a little farther down in verse 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men and they see your good works. They glorify God. The point that is made is that everyone sees us. They will Sooner or later, we are seen. You know, sometimes we can, we, can, we can fool people that may not know us. But quite often, if someone knows us, <laughs> we, they cannot fool us. We always think about how a child cannot, they cannot fool their mother. How does, how does mom know? How does she know what I'm going to do? But the other, it is also true the other way. We do not fool our children. They, they see our actions. They see our, our language. They see our temper. They, they see our purity. What can I do for God? It might be my example, my choice to not follow in the ways of sin that might help someone else. What I can do for God may be the best help that I can help anyone else and strive to keep myself pure. If I don't, I may never get to work on the rest of this list. <laughs> Another thing that we can see, uh, that we can strive for, and again, maybe especially when we are young, but at any age, 
can we strive to build a Christian personality? Do we keep God in our speech? Do we emphasize, do we, do we act in, in prayer and study the word righteousness? John talks about those who are righteous are those who practice righteousness in 1 John. Matthew chapter 16 and, and, and verse 26, it says, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, in, in, uh, well, I go back to the, to the light of the world a reference in Matthew chapter 5. The very picture of what we can be and that influence and example is something that, that is so important. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Remember, everybody sees your purity. They see your personality. What are you like? Jesus had said, by their fruits you shall know them. And I always always do this. What you know, you think about a tree that has apples on it. What kind of tree is that? <laughs> Peach? No. He says, by their fruits you shall know them. That can be good or bad. We are to, to produce good fruit. That the fruit illustration is, <laughs> Sherry wrote a whole book about stuff like that. But what do people see of us? And what can they pick from us? Because that identifies what we are. With this idea of influence in, in, in keeping ourselves pure and, and showing a personality and habits that are for God, what can I do for God? I can lead others to Christ. But I cannot do it if I am not myself first what God would have me to be. Jesus commanded his disciples to take the gospel to everyone. And you and I can be soul winners. We can win other people to Christ. Nothing enlarges or increases one's faith and excitement for God than to teach someone else. Everybody that has ever talked to someone sat down and said, I want to show you the Bible. I want, to, I want to, to show you what it says. And you see someone wanting to learn and actually wanting to listen to what the Bible says. Your heart is going to pound out of your chest. You either, you might call it being nervous or excited, but there is, but when you see it come about, it is not someone else's job to shine your light. You are the light of the world. What do people see from, from you? When we ask the question as, a, as, an, as an individual, what can Mike do? Well, what can any of us do as individuals to be the best part of the group? I need to be interested in saving other people's souls. It starts with mine, but this is not a secret. The gospel is not a secret. That's why, you know, we even sing the song with the little ones about, uh, about Matthew chapter 5. Hide it under a bushel. How's it go? No! <laughs> I'm going to let it shine. The, the picture of, of that song is is each one of us have an opportunity to shine for the Lord. What can I do? I can help other people become Christians. Timothy was a helper to the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul had a lot of things to say to Timothy personally uh, in the letters to Timothy that have that are so important to us when Timothy was was going to churches he would write to those churches and say don't despise him because he's young and then he would tell Timothy let no one despise your youth <laughs> he was I think Paul was concerned about this sometimes people will see a younger person and they'll say get away kid you bother me 
says, no, don't do that. But then he told Timothy, when he said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, let no one despise your youth, he says, but be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to the reading and exhortation of the doctrine. He says, do not neglect the gift that's in you, uh, which was uh, given to you by, uh, by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. You know, if we are growing as a Christian, our progress may be evident to all. But the opposite is also true. If I don't care about God, that also will be evident to all. If I want to save someone else, my progress has to be evident. <laughs> my progress has to be evident. And he says, take heed to the doctrine and continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. I, I often heard older preachers years ago say, the best thing that we can do as a Christian to get to heaven is to try to take other people with us. <laughs> because we have to live it. We have to share it. We can lead others to Christ. What can I do? You know, it may not be someone else's job to, to lead my friends to Christ. We can certainly ask for help. <laughs> and we have friends and fellow Christians that will come running to help us. But we might be the ones to tell someone, come and see. Like, like Andrew did like Nathaniel did. We might be the ones to plant the seed to say, come and see. We may not all be, uh, be the, the preacher. We may not all be the class teacher. But we are all the pure influence that somebody else needs to see living this life. What can I do? I can let that light shine and lead others. Well, so are we done? One of the next things we can do is to prepare ourselves in this life for a, a decent profession. We wind up, if we can prepare ourselves to, to, to help others, we can wind up also doing that by thinking about our, our life. As I had said earlier in a, in a class, what do, we, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to study in school? All of those questions that may be, they may be so wide open. And if I had a, a show of hands in the audience of those that, where you are working now, is it where you were work, where you plan to work as a, when someone asks you as, as a child, what do you want to do, where do you want to work, what do you want to do when you grow up? Is anybody doing what they said? You know what, I'm not. <laughs> I wanted to be an architect until I realized that me and math weren't the best of friends all the time. But how many people does life change that way? that life and opportunities and career paths, very rarely are there people, maybe, maybe doctors or, or teachers, and even teachers change career paths, don't they? Very few uh, career paths are things where people are actually doing what they started, what they said when they were a child, this is what I want to do. Because we can we can have some idea of what we would like to do but honestly who knows what time and chance and life will put before us things change what we have to do is to prepare ourselves in some way to say what I'm going to do for a living is going to provide for my family that I'm going to work hard we 
are not to be takers, but prepare ourselves to be givers. And the picture that we see throughout the scripture is one that talks about things like that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly to those who are outside as you may lack nothing. That there is a principle, a mindset to say, and, and we try to teach our, our little ones, one day you will lead your own family. One day maybe you're looking after us. <laughs> But one day you will be the one to provide for your own family and, and have the mindset to, to, to work hard. That We don't have to be the most successful person in the world. We have to be faithful to God. And may, our, may, may God bless us in, in, in what our hands find to do. But may it never be what hinders us from being the faithful Christian that we are supposed to be we plant the seeds in our minds that we are to take care of ourselves and take care of our own and try to help others as best we can to be hard workers but to let that be under the guise of seeking first the kingdom well turn the corner here build a the idea of to build a christian home there are so many times and, and i talked about in the lesson yesterday uh, the first lesson about the bride for Isaac. The idea of if we are at a, an age where we are still looking for a mate, for a one to, to spend the rest of our life with, to build, this, to build this home, to have an idea what we're looking for, there are some people that have no idea what they, what they want. I used to know a young man that I had, I had made a, a, a challenge in a teen class. And... Uh, that I had, I, they were all sitting around the, around the room, and I had them write down what they were looking for, a list of ten things maybe, what, what they might be thinking about looking for in a, in a mate, in a husband or a wife one of these days. And they all whine, oh, they don't, they, don't want, they don't want to do that. But I tried to make them think, what are you looking for? And I had them turn the page over, and right now, give me a list. And like that first list, the guys can barely think of 10 things. The girls, they think of 25 things. Their list is so long. And I had them turn the list over. And I said, now write down what you have to offer. And that's harder to, this, what, what do I have to offer? Well, if I am looking for someone that is, that is pure and and holy and a good Christian. What's my side of the page say? Do I have that down? I tell you, I, I, I use this as an example because there was a, there was a young man that he, he weighed twice as much as I did. Great, great big kid and he was not, he did not pay attention to his looks all that much or care of himself. Um, <coughs> still had a little bit to learn. <laughs> He put on his list that he was looking for a skinny, pretty girl. That, that, in, in his list. And it's like, buddy. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't single him out. Uh, but I just made this observation. What, what we have to offer, is it what we, are, what we are looking for? When we are to build a Christian home, are we of a mind to say, I, I have an idea of what I want. And this is where I would just plainly say, marry a Christian. If you want somebody to help pull the same direction, life is so full of hardships and difficulties when two people share their faith, when they're going the same way. That's hard enough that to choose to put that obstacle in our way, if that choice is still to be made, then that is, that is an unwise thing. What can I do? I can prepare my mind to say, one of these days, my family will serve the Lord. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
the picture of, of churches needing good leadership. Again, when we are young, that seems like somebody else's job. And it is somebody else's job. But generation after generation of, of young people that I have seen grow up and, and, and come from being the young ones, and there's always somebody older than them. And then all of a sudden to stop, to, to stop them and remind them, do you realize you're the older kids now? And they look around like, yeah. Every generation gets there without knowing it. And the older ones get there the same way, don't we? Whatever age category you find yourself in, you are about to be in the next one. Do we, do we understand what I, what I mean there? And that, that applies to, to young people, to those that are not teenagers yet. You are about, it's not long until you are. Your parents will be totally surprised. <laughs> what, what? Do we realize that we, it's just in a blink that we go from being those younger teenagers to being the older ones all of a sudden? And every age group is the same. When I was 30, my daughter turned five and told, she told me, she says, okay, you have to stay 30. Ha, 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 ha. She was married last summer, and I told her, here, I've stayed 30 all these years, and she clearly has not kept her side of the bargain. We are always moving with where we are. And before we know it, the older ones that we used to rely on so much have passed on. And all of a sudden, we are the we are the older ones. How did that happen? Preparing for leadership within the church does not start at the last minute. As as our as as we are younger in the Lord, we this is when we study the the qualifications for elders and and deacons within the church, and. And the, the preparation of the life that gets to be qualified to be a leader in, in the church is going to be one that doesn't start at the last minute. What can I do for God? I can prepare my mind in so many ways. And one of them is to, to prepare, to say, one of these days, I want to be even more useful in the Lord's service. There are responsibilities that are going to come. Whatever is the next group that I am in. Most of you know Barry and Maria Burns. I had said this in a, in a sermon back at Wellenport where I said, whatever age group you're in, you're about to be in the next one. And Barry looks up and he says, that's absolutely terrifying. <coughs> it's like, not you, Barry. <laughs> not you. Everybody else. What can we do for God? We can, we can at any time see who needs encouraging. And there is no little or no insignificant encouragement that we, that we can bless others with. Little compliments, they mean so much. Little, little as, one, as one preacher said, little touches of kindness may be the difference in someone's life when someone is about to stumble or they are down. We are told in Galatians chapter 6, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Sometimes those burdens are huge. And we think, oh, I don't want to deal with that. But you know, most of the time, day to day, they're not. That most of the time, day to day, we can be an encouraging influence to, to younger ones. To talk to them and say, how's school going? Now watch out for this when they try to teach you this. Or ask them how things are going. Engage people that are not necessarily in your age group. Talk to somebody older or younger. See what you can do to encourage anybody. There is not a, there's not a statement that says bear one another's burdens, but only if you're related to them. Bear one another's burdens, but only if you know them really well. 
Well, there's one way to get to know our church family is to actually engage them, to talk to them, be hospitable to them. This is, this is the picture of what can I do. But more than anything, we can have the resolve, and the last one that we'll see here, is to be faithful throughout our life. When Joshua had told the people, choose whom you will serve, back there in Joshua chapter 24, he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As much as Joshua could speak for his family and those that he left, led, he said, we choose the Lord. And, and the, it may not be a guarantee that we instill that in everybody we have influence in, but if we don't, then it's pretty sure, pretty sure that the rest of them won't either. That we have, to, we have to have that resolve to say, I'm going to be faithful to God all my life. You know, I, I've said this, and what a beautiful thing it is to see, to see little ones. We, how do we not love babies? They're so cute. But you know, sometimes they can wear a mother to a, to a frazzle. Now, I don't know, you guys must pay extra for the quiet ones. I never, I haven't heard them, heard of it. <laughs> how, do they, how do you get, how do they so nice and quiet? It's wonderful. But you know what, sometimes they're not. Sometimes Sherry would, we, we would ride home from, from church services and she would say, can you tell me what the sermon was about? I didn't hear a thing. And those young moms need to be encouraged to hang on. Hang in there. Because pretty soon they're going to move to that next age bracket and the next one and the next one and if they've been coming because you have brought them all along there's a far better chance that they can will continue that and, and and to have the result to say I'm going to serve the Lord and anybody that I can influence they're going to you know it's the best thing in the world when the little ones can't remember when they started going to church but there's never a day that they weren't <laughs> that mom didn't drag them along and sometimes that's hard but we are all of to, to benefit from it. It is an encouragement to everybody to see that. It is an encouragement, young and old, to see everybody else's struggle. And, and it is not easy, day in and day out, to be faithful. And we need to be. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, the last verse we'll look at here, says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, I got one more on there. With John 4, it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What can I do for God? I can remember that God is the biggest. God is bigger than any difficulty that I have. God has loved me so much that he sent his son to die for me, for my sins. 